Courtyard filmed in beautiful Hillsburg, California. Today I am with Sam Lando, the owner and operator of Lando Wines, very hands-on owner, and also with George Christie, who is our wine industry professional. Oh. Whatever that is. Yes, today oh. you're a professional. I'm trying a new title out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excellent. And this exciting, the band is back together. Yes. We haven't we haven't done a show in a while, and um, we're all vaccinated, which is very exciting. Absolutely. So, um, so here's to you being here, and here's to vaccinations. Ah, uh, thank you. Here's to vaccinations. Like we're getting on the other Always side. Cheers. Likewise, George. Ooh. And this wine is absolutely delicious. Tell us what we are drinking really quickly. Yep, this is uh, our first vintage so good. 2019 Halo proprietary blend Chardonnay. So the the idea for this was uh, during harvest in 19. We have two single vineyard Chardonnays we work with, and we, we came upon some other incredible Chardonnay fruit, about two tons, right at the last minute. And we didn't want to create another single vineyard Chardonnay. So as we were getting towards uh, bottling time, I said, you know, this would be kind of fun. Let's look at a barrel of this, a barrel of that, and let's put something together where we can have sort of a catch-all proprietary blend, beautiful Chardonnay from the Russian River Valley. And it was so complex and absolutely different than the other Chardonnays, it made just absolute sense. It's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. How, how many barrels is it? This was five barrels. Wow. Well, Small. Now, is this something, I'm just gonna start here. Can mm -hmm. people buy this wine? Your wines are very limited. They are. Right? Uh, this wine is sold out. So we, we, we're one of those, those weird it. little wineries, Susie, where technically we only sell our wine twice a year three weeks in the spring, three weeks in the fall, and mostly to a list of mailing list friends, we call them, it's direct consumer, but it's not where, it's not where somebody can say, hey, I'd like to buy four cases of your wine. Because we do everything, everything is done by hand, everything is very select, it's very small, uh, every bottle is very precious, every one of our friends on our mailing list has a unique and special allocation of wines. So, I mean, we, of the 125 or 115 cases of this, a lot of folks that were interested in Chardonnay on our mailing list got an allocation of maybe two bottles. Okay. So do you sort of follow the uh, William Selliam program where we the do. longer you're on the list, the more access you have? And Absolutely. That type of thing? Absolutely. So I was with William Selliam for a good couple of years. Uh, we were talking about you know Bob Cabral earlier. Bob's a dear friend. And uh, it was a great time there. I was their director of marketing for a couple of good years. And then uh, got recruited to be with Costa Brown. And you were, in, uh, you were the director of sales and marketing for them as well? Director of sales and marketing for William Salim and for Costa Brown. And gosh, during my time, there was a little stint at a Cabernet producer before Costa Brown. I started hobby winemaking at that time. And it was really kind of a, I don't want to say necessity, but I mean, we were buying diapers and wipes and we weren't, we weren't drinking our expensive wines. I mean, we were buying baby stuff. <laughs> and uh, my brother-in-law came into ownership of a little vineyard in Geyserville. And the first, going way back to the mid-90s, the first company that hired me out of college put me back into school for viticulture and enology extension courses uh, because they wanted to have a marketing sales guy who knew how to grow grapes and make wine. And uh, so, you know, flash forward, we're 2005. My brother-in-law gets part ownership of this little Merlot vineyard. And we're watching the kids run around. And in Sonoma County? In Geyserville. In Geyserville, nice. So, and actually it was, it was an old Clos de Bois vineyard okay. uh, that used to go into their reserve Merlot program. So we were talking one night, having a couple of beers, watching the kids run around, get dirty in the vineyard. And I said, you know, it'd be fun if you gave me a ton of Merlot for free, I'll do all the winemaking, we'll, we'll, I'll buy the barrels, I'll do the bottling filtering, but I bet you I can make better than a $20 bottle of wine. Something that we could just enjoy Monday through Thursday, no holds barred, pull the corks and have some quaffable, decent juice. Well, yeah, and, and it's from a very respectable Merlot growing area absolutely. in Alexander Valley. So that Even first better. that first little vintage, uh, surprise, surprise, came out really well. Uh, friends and family were absolutely blown away by, you know, that first, I, literally like Johnny Appleseed, just dropping off cases to friends and family. And uh, the next thing you know, we had people helping us buy grapes and helping us buy barrels. And that went on for, gosh, six or seven vintages. So finally, you know, in 2012, I was working for Costa Brown at the time. And 
I get back into the cellar at the end of the evening or the end of the, the day to sanitize your, barrels. Your home, your home cellar? Correct. Well, no, this was a cellar at, at cost of wine. They were kind oh, okay. enough. Most so of the were, wineries. So you were custom crushing there. Most of the wineries that I worked with allowed me to store my barrels and do those. Part of, if I was there doing my work, it was nice that a lot of guys let me just make some wine on the side. Well, obviously, you're good at what you do. <laughs> we try. We, we try. I, it's. Uh, it's been one hell of a road, and I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world, but uh, it's these last four years in particular. I mean, I've been in this, this is weird. I've been in this industry now for 27 years, yeah. and these last four years have been the most unscripted, bizarre shit I've ever seen in my entire career. Well, um, I think George and I would both agree that it's nice that um, you were a sales and marketing person who learned how to make wine instead of a winemaker learning how to market and sell. It's I mean, because the sales and marketing, we all know, is the hardest job in the industry. Yeah, it so, is. So so good for you. And you're with some really, really great companies. It is. And it's still, I mean, the, the dynamics, I mean, what what we were doing marketing and sales wise five years ago, let, a ten, let alone 10 years ago, it's it's not working like it used to, right. especially on the direct consumer side. I mean, re restaurants are what they are until last year with COVID. I mean, 25% of our business is restaurants. That 25% of our business disappeared last year, just kind of flew away, gone. Uh, hopefully, it's starting to come back as people are are beginning, you know, restaurants are starting to open up again across the country. Uh -huh. We're able to start uh, seeing some of these restaurants come back to life, but I'll tell you, the biggest problem is, and I was just in Atlanta for seven days and, and rolled directly into North Carolina, I'll be damned if most of those employees don't want to go back to their original line of work. Whether it's collecting unemployment or yeah. restaurateurs that are starting to wake up, they can't bring, there's no staff. Yeah. Nobody wants to go back. Right. So it's, it's really, it, the whole series is just, it's, it's unlike anything I've ever seen. Well, now you had, I mean, the, your, your journey has been a, a challenging one because mm -hmm. you started in, it was your first, uh, vintage in 2012 that you were selling to people? First vintage was 2012 and we sold that vintage, started selling that one in 2014. Okay, and then you and then you had some good years of We had some good years. It was, you know, so for, the, the, the crazy thing is when you look at how, how we architect our, our brand, the wine is in the barrel, the Pinot Noir is in the barrel for 17, sometimes 18 months. So it's almost like we're a high-end Cabernet producer. That wine is not released until two years from the time we start working with it with Harvest. So you had to have enough capital starting out. We had our 2012 vintage, and then you've got that sitting in barrel, paid for. Yeah, I know. You go into the 13 vintage, and you're trying to increase a little bit. So then you've got more barrels. I mean, it's all, we have yeah, two sets people, of barrels. We have people forget about that aspect right. of it. So and we, plus, you don't know what the supply should be. Or right. So we have two vintages working. By the time we get into that third year and start selling that first vintage of wine, and then shocker, that's the smallest amount of wine you've ever made. So it's a blip of revenue that <laughs> is just gone yeah. uh, on top of the scheme of things. So we had we had 14. We had and then 15. I mean, we were looking at okay, let's go. And then that harvest was almost cut in half by the really the the really significant drought that we had in 2015. Yeah. Uh, so we we weren't That's able to do. Harvest. We were doing 40 percent less than what we were hoping to. And then in 16 we had a we had a pretty darn decent vintage, but we lost that vintage in the fires in the tubs fire in 2017. So it's really kind of. <laughs> it's been a consistent kick to the balls. I mean I, I really. Uh, <laughs> and I'm sorry if that's a little, but it's it's. Um, no. The, the sadist in me starts to kind of like it. I'm like, you know what, come on, bring on another punch. <laughs> bring on another kick. It. I'm good with that. Let's go. Let's. <laughs> what else you got? Yeah. You know, and, 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 and the shitty thing is every time we say that, there's a harder kick. Like, wow. I mean, it's really okay. Well, let's not say know, that anymore. The, the classic rule in business is whatever you do, don't waste a good disaster. Absolutely. So you, you, you need to learn something, of Absolutely. course, which and, you did. And we have. I mean, it's really... The fun thing is my, my son eventually wants to be our winemaker. He's in his freshman year of high school. Both the kids have been in vineyards with me when I had them in, you know, baby Bjorns, everybody, it's a true family business. Everybody helps out. And it's really, it was fun. It was the other night I'm telling him, I'm going, you know, I really, I'm learning something new every day. These last four years, it is pushing the envelope on everything I ever thought I knew about this industry. It, it, it just spin it 
40, 45 degrees. It's a totally different point of view, positioning, everything else is, is different. But the one constant, the one constant that has been really good and, and very great is relationships and being authentic and being genuine and being who you are. And that's, that's one thing that I'm, I'm pretty capable of being consistent with who I am and what we do and telling people the actual, you know, some, I wear my heart on my sleeve way too often and I, I let people, it, I'm an open book. I mean, it's there. Um, and, but that, I think, has also been to our benefit because people really know where they, where they sit with us and, and what we're doing and how, how we're really trying to move forward. And it's, well, it's been great. Yes, and I, I don't, pretension can only sell for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sell for, it doesn't, pretension doesn't have longevity. It doesn't. Yeah. It's well, very true. George is getting a little low on Chardonnay. I know. Well, we, <laughs> George is always low on everything. George, do we want to go to Pinot? Do we want to try some Pinot? Well, should we try? We jump. Do, I mean, do we wanna, just do an over the do shoulder. Try the, let's try the other let's go. Chardonnay. Well, the other or Chardonnay is exactly the same. It's the same. It's the same mm -hmm. one. Oh, well then let's go. I just figured Pino. it's a nice evening. We might want let's more go. Chardonnay. Oh, later. well, absolutely. This uh, is only. <laughs> I mean, we finished with the show. We have something to do. Right. Exactly. Just said something that reminded me of. Uh, your, I don't know if it was over the summer, but it's, you talked about you know being it's a full Thank family you. deal. Absolutely. Uh, wasn't like at some point was it maybe early summer? Like you took the family on vacation to like deliver like basically like oh. deliver wines to your like best customers. Like it was it was, oh, that, was the, that was the vacation was it wasn't a bit, and, and, and <laughs> that's thing social that's media funny. makes things look very glamorous yeah, yeah kids were uh, heading off to there, michigan or. there was zero when, when i talk about that there was nothing enjoyable about it i mean <laughs> it was for me and and i don't mean that in a sense of it being uh it it was great to have the family and the kids but when when covid clamped down our main way of uh meeting new folks that are interested in our wines i mean we don't have a tasting room we're not open to the public right I normally am doing charity wine auction events across the country. Right. So before COVID happened, I had 18 events, travel. So you're, you're attending them and showing your wines. And showing the wines, but also setting up auction being. lots. So right. I mean, I, if we could make 10,000 cases of our quality of wine, I could sell every single drop of it in Atlanta. I've been going to Atlanta for 20 years. The amount of chefs, the amount of consumers, the amount of friends and doing these auction lots you do them over the course of time, you genuinely, again, this is that relationship building, you become such good friends with a lot of these folks that buy your auction lots, or you're spending time in their guest room at their houses, and we're doing dinners, well, yeah. we're doing events. How did Atlanta become a big state for you? A Atlanta, I, I started traveling to Atlanta when I was working for Behringer Wine Estates back in the early 2000s, and doing some events there and getting to meet folks. So it, it started to become one of my I mean, I've been honestly been going, with the exception of COVID, I've been going there religiously for 20 years. Well, Atlanta's and, a great wine yeah. city. And it really, it, it started happening after the Olympics in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. They revitalized the downtown. There was a lot of, you know, commercial space. It coincided with all these incredible chefs coming out of culinary school. Chefs were yeah, becoming yeah. these celebrities. Big I, companies I, moved in. I used in. to live there. Oh, so you, you, yeah, before, you're familiar with the Yeah, prior to the wine deal. industry, I lived in Atlanta, but so it's a great city. We do these charity wine auction events because it allows us to meet philanthropic, great people. But when COVID clamped down, I, mean, I remember I got home that night and my wife, Jen, and the kids were going, uh, what are we going to do? Was right. this literally at the beginning? Like this was March? right at the beginning. I mean, that, that day that Trump announced that we were shutting everything down, everything is clamped down. Yeah. And I had wine spread out all over the country. We had travel planned. I mean, we were ready to, I mean, it was, Right in March, my, my heavy time of doing all these events goes from March through May. Right. And so, you know, they were looking at me going, what are we going to do? And I said, well, <laughs> go. Um, and I think it's time to like break this out of the playbook. <laughs> I love Tomorrow, this. I'm going to buy a 25 foot travel trailer. <laughs> Kids, the dog, and my wife, Jen. <laughs> and we're going to reach out to country club friends, sommeliers, general managers, private consumers, restaurateurs, and we're gonna travel the Pacific Northwest and we're gonna do outdoors events safely with masks and gloves. We're gonna barbecue, we're gonna bring the bounty of Sonoma County, we're gonna do food, touchless, I mean the kids are gonna help out and we're gonna do this whole thing and yet you guys are doing remote distance learning so you can, we can be anywhere in the world. Oh, yeah. that's true. Let's go do this. And they looked at me and they went, 
Okay, let's do this. Ready, okay, I, break. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> I'm, I'm interrupting you for one moment just yes. because I want to... Oh, okay, we are rolling. <laughs> oh, there it is. That's the back end of the trailer. So we called it the Sonoma Social Distance Wine Tour. <laughs> Some sponsors, we had a DCS kitchen equipment, oh, uh, grills, DCS. Dustin Vallette, local, local favorite here in town, prepped a lot of food for us. Yeti coolers, uh, Go Vino. So I mean, we would tell a lot of these folks as we were coming around, we're like, hey, the only thing we want or require is that you bring in good wine loving folks. We're gonna limit it to 40 or 50 people. We're gonna set up the event through Eventbrite. So it's gonna be touchless. We'll add everybody to the mailing list. And then we, I said, you know, we're gonna have some crazy other wine friends join along. So, um, James McPhail with his Tongue Dancer brand, San Giacomo. We've had the Fritz family uh, winery come with us. Uh, Corsi Graves, another good buddy would, colleague. Would they, would they get their own rig? They would have RVs, <laughs> and we would, we would, I mean, the first trip, we did 3,600 miles and two and a half weeks. Okay, now, t sorry, I'm interrupting you again no, let's to do talk it. This, about the wine for a I moment. I thought this just would just be moment. fun. I brought two of our proprietary blends. This is the Truth and Valor, and this is a 2017 vintage. It's really nice. Sonoma Coast. Nice. And this is from a single vineyard? or This is from several? two high elevation vineyards. One on the... the truth and Valor? Well, that, <laughs> that's a whole other story. I mean, proprietary blends, I didn't want to do single vineyard Pinots. Uh, because over the mm. over the time, this is how I'd seen it play out with uh, Costa Brown and William Selim over the years. You start getting great ratings for a wine. That wonderful grower starts raising the prices more and more. <laughs> oh, they would. And then do the next thing, eventually, they, they want to have their own winery. <laughs> so, I, as much as I like marketing and advocating other people, so you know, I want to have names that have meaning and resonance to my family and I. Yeah. So, Truth and Valor, it's a vineyard that we helped plant uh, orient, orientation and design uh, on Sonoma Mountain above Gap's Crown. We took out a long-term contract on this. And now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the area, that's mm -hmm. a very cool part it of uh, the Russian Pedal River the Valley. Pedal and the, gap. the coolest part yep. of mm -hmm. the Russian River Valley. And when sometimes there can be ripening challenges. So, very much so. So typically, um, there's more thinning involved, meaning that yields have to be lower mm -hmm. for it to get ripe, and so you've got higher quality. Definitely. And um, very, very long hang time. Yes. So this one vineyard, Sonoma Mountain, it is... Uh, 800 feet elevation, so it means smaller berries, really tiny, very potent, very intense. And then you go all the way across Petaluma Gap into the true Sonoma Coast, another new vineyard, um, five, five Wells, beautiful little vineyard, but very small berries. I mean, all the berries in this first vintage in 17 looked like little BBs, hardly with any seeds, yeah. uh, but really, really potent, was very luscious fruit. Was that the first crop? That was the first crop in 17. So, was you, so wow. Yeah, so first it was... Crop? It was very small. We did a, a, a whopping 98 cases of this wine. So I thought it'd be fun well, to share. We're honored to. That's great. And Truth it. and Valor, Truth and Valor uh, really pays homage to being an entrepreneur. I mean, there there is the truth in a sense of taking the risk and the fear of persevering to do the right thing and the valor or the courage to stay that path and course when there is a huge amount of unknowns. Oh, I yeah. love that. Yeah. It's not for everyone. No. I tell people all the time, no, like, it's hey, not. you like having a little bit? They go, yeah, mm -hmm. but it's not for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably not for you. Probably yeah, exactly. <laughs> you get a little squeamish. I mean, there are plenty of times I want to get in the fetal position and just cry myself to sleep. Yeah. But that, that's being an entrepreneur. That's that's, yeah, it's that's not, taking the risk. It's not yeah. for wimps, that's for sure. No, it is not. Or if you're really into sleeping, for instance, forget it. Yeah, right? <laughs> if you're really into sleep, that's a really good point. <laughs> so... The so Sonoma social distance thing. We we uh, from no, yeah. Well, back to this trip. So yeah. you're you're all are they are they all driving from here and you're meeting in different places? Were you like we, a convoy? Like were you guys? Like it was a convoy. Like, we, like break them one night. We didn't, break have, one, we didn't, have, uh, we didn't have radios. We, only, we had our phones. That that first trip was a convoy. <laughs> we had uh, we had three other wine brands with us, and we left we left from uh, the town of Windsor all at the same time. It was Oregon. Montana, Idaho, or it was Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, back down through Nevada. I mean, but we did from that point in May through the end of August, we drove over 16,000 miles and did 36 events. Now, I, I don't nuts. mean to um, drag down this conversation with mm -hmm. logistics, but did you set up 
everything in advance? Did you set up the camp sites, or did you, or did you wing it? It was had to well at that at like that point, and by up. the time we were leaving in April, every state and county's regulations were different and um, and they were changing rapidly they were changing while we were on the road yeah so, I mean I have my wife in the passenger seat and she's going holy crap this is now different in Coeur d'Alene Idaho we can't do this we need to go and so the next year we're asking that host you have a friend in this other county where it's a little bit open and we can do this we can shift people over it was the most uh, complicated series of steps and scenarios but we figured it out, and we tell everybody all the time, we got to ebb and, ebb and flow. Well, That's what we're doing. especially with more than one vehicle. It was pretty crazy. Did you, you use, did you use Harvest Test at all? No, no, not at all. It was figuring out what RV campgrounds were. RV campgrounds, private, I mean, we stayed in some, some places we were staying in people's driveways yeah. on their streets. You know, hey, can we run 110 power out <laughs> to the vehicles? Yeah. And, and then the vehicles were also, I mean, it was food prep. We were... It was like we were high-end caterers and wineries as well. So we're prepping food and getting ready to do our tastings. And then we'd set everything up. So we had our own linens. We had our own tables. And the, the hosts were going, how, how are you guys doing this? So, yeah. so we, know, we know how to throw events, so you would, um So you would throw the party with your vehicle. So you, you had everything with you. And then pe people would come to you. We would, in some instances, we would have everything situated at a location. But in, like we, when we were in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, we were able to pull everything into a certain spot, and then we would have one RV as a chase vehicle that we would gather all of our gear and throw us all in there. We'd, it was like a clown car. We'd all come spilling out oh my of God. all of our wine. I mean, it was it was absolutely it was that is just fantastic. It was some great <laughs> memories. Yeah. I mean, and especially the kids. I mean, that that's the one between all the the adversity between losing a vintage, between having all these other adverse things happen to us. It's one of my most proud things that with the kids, when, when things go bad, we figure things out. We don't quit, right. we don't stop, we ebb and flow and we figure out the best path. We're gonna still deliver the best quality as to what we can do, but I'm not gonna let us go down. We are going to figure out the best way to make this happen yeah. and do it for our family and for our, our customers and our patrons. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to be fluid in market downturns and market situations anyway but that's just such a great story thank you so i'm really curious about this whole camping thing so, so, <laughs> so much. See, now i don't believe maybe said we didn't uh, have any fun at all i can tell you I had oh a lot of man fun. well there, there was you had fun i know i admit it like and, and it I, was edgy and how many it was so edgy how many of you so were there three wineries at once or four so at the first the first one the first trip that I we did go right now so the first trip it was uh james mcphail and his daughter Haley for tongue dancer and they had an airstream and then we had my good friend megan and her husband Dodds for Sam Giacomo, and they had a rented RV. And then we had another group, uh, Sam Williamson and my distributor in Georgia, or not in Georgia, in Montana, they started out the trek in Montana. So they followed along wow. with us to Jackson Hole and a couple of stuff. I mean, we did Bozeman, we were in Kalispell, Montana. We were almost in the Canadian border. And, and did you have mailing lists big enough that stretched that far? And they, it, and, it was and referrals, referrals of referrals, matter. and then in some of these instances where we were doing country clubs and, and restaurants, and all of a sudden you met some folks, and then it would gain more traction where they're going, well, can you come back and do this with us? Right. I mean, we went back to Jackson Hole three times. I mean, it was absolutely insane, and did it was, you, it was did great. Did you do some cold calling, too? <coughs> did you say, oh, well, I hear that the It was really Atlanta through the country first country relationships. Is, it was really uh -huh. through the first relationships, and then when we did one event... There were usually 10 people at that event going, oh my gosh, you need to contact this, this, this. Right. So it was then a, a whole spillover of other relationships that kind of spurred the next couple of events. It was really wild. Did you golf at all? No, there was no <laughs> golf. I mean, if you can imagine, so day one, we drove nine and a half hours to Bend, Oregon. So by the time we got to the site in Bend, Oregon, it was almost dusk. So it was all we could do to like drop anchor right. and cook. Right and then get into the trailer and sleep. And believe it or not, we that was our first trailer. We bought this first, and we realized after the first trip that it wasn't gonna work. So we sold that. On, I sold it on Craigslist for $1,000 more than we bought it for. And we bought another trailer. Nice. That was actually dual axle. Demand uh, went up during oh, that. Oh, it was huge. It was, it was crazy. <laughs> but uh, that, that first trailer, this is, this is, George, this is to your point. Were you having fun? <laughs> 
So from Bend, Oregon, we drove all the way to, uh, it was Flat Iron Lake, I think is the name of it, in Montana. So it was 14 uh, and a half Lake. hour. Flathead. Yeah. yeah, you're thinking of Flat Iron Steak. That's way up there Flathead too. That's, way, that's at the top. 14 and a half hours from yeah. Bend, Oregon. So when we got there, we were meeting our friend who was our distributor as well, new distributor, hadn't spent a lot of time, never been in this area. And he tells us while we're, while we're driving, he goes, oh my gosh, you gotta get here sooner. We have you know, some key restaurant tours. I'm putting together this dinner and I'm going, dude, we're driving, man. We're towing a bunch of shit. We're not, this is as much as we can do. So we didn't, we didn't get there until 11 o'clock at night. And it's, it's cold. I mean, it's in, it's in May and it's still That's way like up 32, there. 33 degrees. Yeah. And so we get done having dinner and we still hadn't even put our trailers and RVs at the RV park. So we show up there and, and we've got this new trailer. We tested it out. It was new off the lot. It's by this time, 1.30 in the morning, it's starting to snow, we're in mud. And we, because this trailer with the first one was so small, we had to remove half of our contents to just be able to get the slide out out, right. get all the kids in the bed. So we're doing this at 1.30 in the morning. Well, we're removing everything. I go to turn the heater on, because it's, now it's snowing. Uh -oh. The heater works for a minute, and then all of a sudden the smoke alarm starts going off. It's got some like weird, some like gaseous smell. So we shut that off, evacuate everybody. And then I go to hit the slide out button and the slide out doesn't work. Motor's not working, nothing. There is no, like nothing. Oh. It turns out we were probably a little bit overloaded. I think we had a little too much weight in the one trailer. Case, one case too many. It, <laughs> <laughs> the the tires were a little cambered out, oh, uh, so I awful. think we we had a Dukes of Hazard jump that we hit. <laughs> that uh, I mean I think it really bent the axle and I think it threw. Oh. So it was uh, that was the start of the trip and we suffered through that whole thing for another two weeks, two and a half weeks. So it was it was a challenge, but getting there were very few seldom spots where we were staying there for more than two nights. Right. So a lot of these instances, you're you're doing an event, you're cleaning up you're getting about three and a half or four hours of sleep and then you've got to get on the road to go to the next spot. There were some instances where we were, we had the generator on in the trailer so we could have power while we're driving where I'm sous vide meat in the bathtub in a tub to get ready to cook that six hours later. When we're now, getting, it, was, uh, it was crazy. That's wild, for, man. for those yeah. people who may have jumped in a little late yeah. in this mm -hmm. fabulous show, <laughs> Jeez. Sam Lando, the owner and operator of Lando Wines um, is talking about actually uh, creating his own marketing plan during COVID and getting an RV and taking Survival. his family <laughs> across yeah. the country and meeting some other brands. That's just amazing. It was crazy. Yeah, but it was, talk about a galvanizing experience. I mean, it was, it was awesome for the kids. It was just for all of us, just to figure it out and not cool. sit there and twiddle our thumbs it was for six months. also awesome for the people you saw because yeah. it gave yeah. them a place and obviously everything was outside so. everything was outside everybody was masked uh, we had you know 50 gallon drums of, of lube for everybody to sanitize <laughs> uh, we had no no seated tables I mean it was we we told everybody this is standing room only we don't want people to congregate yeah um, it was it was very safe I mean but we think about that doing 36 events and traveling over 16,000 miles now, were you working the grill the whole time too because because he does some he's like a chef too he does like he does <laughs> cooking videos cooking. yeah no I, I like pay I pay attention to them like oh, I always learn something when I watch Sam cook <laughs> it was it was a kick but I mean we would we would usually have our tasting table as a V so I'd have the barbecue on this side and then Jen's pouring wine and when there was any you know a lot of the a lot of folks like to play let's stump the cork dork and I'd tell her I'm like all right hey Send them over to me. I'm right here. You know, let's. Right. <laughs> it was it was a great time. I mean, it was it was challenging. It was exhausting, but I mean, we we grew our mailing list. We yeah. we grew oh, everything sure. that we. Absent of having you know most of our restaurant friends across the country and and not being able to do events, it was a true pivot uh, to doing something that was was still very relevant to how we do our business. Now, were were you ever um, actually at at restaurants in an outdoor setting or were they always we coming were. to you? So you would still bring all of your... In some of these instances, there were like, uh, when we were in Sun Valley, Idaho, this one restaurant was, had been closed until the week we arrived and it was in mid-June. And it was really funny. I said, man, we've got the barbecue, we've got everything. And he just laughed. He goes, stop, just bring your food, man. 
because my crew is so eager to just cook. We haven't cooked in three months. And it was, it was, it was the only place where they just went, no, no, no. Just tell us how you want to do it and come in and check us, but we've got this. And it was, it was really, it was cool. Very refreshing and, and great. But there were, there were some spots uh, where we were in Bozeman, Montana. This one gentleman had this, you know, that uh, the Gallatin River where um, Brad Pitt, a river runs through it where he's oh, yeah, yeah. fly fishing out there. I mean, we're lumping, James McPhail and I and, and uh, Dodds, my other, but we're, we're moving this 150 pound barbecue in the middle of this downward slope, <laughs> getting on the stand and we, we, we loaded up and we looked around, we're going, this is the coolest <laughs> setting ever. I mean, barbecue and then just Gallatin River. Beautiful, like just and it mother was just nature stunning. It was steroids. stunning and we're going, really, there are gonna be 50 people showing up? So we're in a field. It was like that, you know, you were all of a sudden like clockwork, there were people there hanging out, drinking wine and, yeah. and gathering around the barbecue and the campfire. And it was people across the country have been eager. I mean, we're, we're social species by nature. I mean, the oh, being sure forced to that. not be around people uh, has, has, it's tough. It's been tough for a lot of us. I mean, some, some folks that are true introverts, this has been like the pleasure of their lives yeah, to not yeah. be disrupted and be able to hold themselves away. But for the greater majority of us to not have that connection and not have that, that part of our lives. Well, plus people who are passionate about food and wine typically right. like the social aspects. Absolutely. Of enjoying a meal and cooking. Right. Now, um, may we try Yes, your we next may. Pino, please. Mm. And in fact, uh, you have some a group of fans here. I know, Perhaps we're gonna have to we spread that around. <laughs> the couch this patrol, over here, you yes. guys, absolutely. Yes. They can't be hecklers. They're being very well behaved uh, today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, give them a few minutes. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. That was a great hey, story. I, I feel like I'm being a bad hostess here, but Oh, my thank gosh. You. Are you kidding me? Gosh, very nice. So this one, <clears throat> this is a fun story. <clears throat> okay, th now, this this is the wine. It yes. It is called... Sauve la vie. <clears throat> And if anybody had mentioned or asked years ago if I would ever have a French name on one of our wines, I would have said you were effing crazy. But you would have said it in French, of course. You are effing crazy. You are crazy. <laughs> um, this crazy. is, so we have about 14 vineyards that we work with. We don't own our own vineyards. We're handy enough with farming to usually help guide and uh, pay a lot of attention to the little blocks that we're working with to really get superior quality and we've got some great grower farmer partners we work with. This vineyard, <coughs> Lee Martinelli, who is a very dear friend, uh, back in, I think it was 2016, reached out to me, he said, Sam, you gotta come check out this little vineyard. It's right next to our little family home block off of uh, Wooler Road. And uh, this guy, he's got an acre and a half open and it would be primo stuff for what you do. So I get out there, I meet with him, and we're walking the vineyard. He's showing me the block, and I'm going, ah, oh, this, is, this is great. So I give him my card, and he looks at me, and he looks at the card, and he looks at me again. He goes, is your wife Jennifer? And I said, yeah, Stu, you're kind of creeping me out. What's, <laughs> uh, you know, mind you, this gentleman's in his you know, early, late 70s or so at the time, and, and he, he says, you know, she was the only one I saved right before I retired from Memorial Hospital. So my wife, when she delivered our daughter, she ruptured her uterus and they, they gave her like a 15% chance of survival. Oh, she was in surgery wow. for nine hours, never met this guy. And he was the oh. old, uh, old veteran emergency room doctor that was able to get her stabilized. So between him and my wife's OBGYN, this guy, Leela Ahmad, who is incredible, they were able to get her stabilized. Oh, but I mean, I had a good six hours where I thought I was gonna be a single dad with a two-year-old and a newborn going, holy oh. crap. So I had told him, I said, boy, if this, if this vineyard is half of what I think it is, we're gonna create a special wine called Savior something. We'll figure that out. Nice. So we, we get a couple years ahead and the Tubbs fire happens, which takes out our entire 2016 vintage and I'm trying to distract myself from all the, the weird crap going on with that. So a couple of days after that, I'm working on this. You know, are we gonna create a different label? What are we gonna call this wine? So had you harvested the grapes, it was in barrels at this point? Yes, and 
and how the, many, the 16 how vintage many tons was gone. Did you get from that? Usually four. Vintage? I think it was four or five tons from this okay. little block that we have. So the 17 vintage was safely at our new custom crush facility. The 16 vintage we lost in the fires. So I'm sitting there working on this, and my phone rings, and it's one of my favorite Cooperage guys, uh, Boot Cooperage, uh, Philippe. And he says, hey, he goes, Sam, he goes, how are you? Is the family good? Are you okay? And I'm going, oh, we are, we are fine. And he says, I want to talk to you about the invoice that we have out. And I went, oh, my gosh, I know. And it was, it was a heavy barrel invoice that was out. And I said, man, as soon as we can figure out what's going to happen, trust me. He goes, no, 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 I don't want you to pay. And I said, you don't want me to pay? And he goes, no, 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 I want you to pay. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be now. It doesn't have to be six months. It doesn't have to be six years. You are family. We've got you. And I went, oh. oh, God. So I'm... I'm getting choked up, and, I, and it was right then as I'm looking at this, I'm going, okay, so how do you say savior in French? He goes, oh, no, no, it's not savior. He goes, you want the act of saving. That is even better. He goes, sauve la vie, the act of saving. So again, having Huge. names. I start oh, crying man, no, here. it's, it's, <laughs> so this is, hard. this is five barrels from Boot Cooperage, all from that one Cooper, and all from, um, all from this one vineyard, nice. and it's unfiltered, unfined. How many Coopers are there? Oh my God! Hundreds. Yeah, I mean, hundreds in there? France. Hundreds. They're just everywhere. I think they're like there small wineries. You know they what are. I mean? They're they're so big wineries and big coopers and so small. So it's nice when you find some a cooper you love, and, and they're very much like family too. There That's there are amazing. five five that we work with, and they're they're the regime as to how we do things. I mean, we know the vineyards, we know the fruit complexion, and it's really, I tell people all the time, you know, the, the barrel game is 40% of what we do. The consistency with those barrels, because a new barrel has X amount of pungency, and I know what that new barrel from these five Coopers is going to do. It's gonna curve something up, or cut it in the middle, or take it in another direction a little bit south. And then once that barrel's been used for 18 months, it has an entirely different effect. So we're, most of our wines are usually 40 to 45% new French oak, and then 25% of once used barrels, and then the remainder mostly neutral. Well, it's those. interesting with <laughs> barrels because they, um, you sort of have to, they, they react differently, like one-year-old barrels, two-year-old barrels, like different coopers, mm -hmm. depending on how tight the grain is. Absolutely. So I think people don't realize how, it, it's, a, it's a much bigger decision than it seems. <coughs> it's and huge. And it takes a long time sometimes to decide who you like. And <laughs> Especially when you're small, right? Because when you're, you're right. a big producer, you'd say, yeah, I'll try a couple of those, and I'll try a couple of those. Exactly. And you sort of see, and mm. then if you don't like it, you lose it in the blend. But but when you're in a situation like Sam, where he's got like, oh, I got three or four, you know, you don't have the luxury of <coughs> going, eh, you know, put that one in the big blend, and we'll just use right. these three. Yeah, right? the big so blend. So it's the big decisions. Yeah, when they're it not is. a big blend. Mm -hmm. And That's it's funny because point. a lot of a lot of our colleagues are like, oh, when you have something that you declassify, and <laughs> right. like, I don't declassify anything, man. I mean, we got to make sure this is not. I don't have the autonomy. We've got to make sure that it's really, really good. Right. You know, garbage in, garbage out. It's got to come in really good, and we just try not to screw it up. Well, and, right. and um, you know, Sam, I admire the fact that you are 100% direct to consumer. It's so much easier now. I do distribute. Well, we, we do 25% distribution. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. but even then, when you distribute, you have a little bit more leeway with declassification or someplace to put yeah. it, and, and it's um, much more careful, precise winemaking right. when you're limited right. to and the it's, quantity. And it's, I mean, of the... I just throw caution to the wind. <laughs> <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> you know, with, with, with the, we have nine distributors in some key markets, and like I was mentioning, I mean, I... The Southeast is a place I really enjoy. We have great friends, uh, but it's really, f I mean, the entire state of Georgia will see 80 cases of wine. Right. It's not a huge amount, but it's more than we have in California. We, we don't have a distributor in Northern California. I've got one in Southern California, and they see 60 cases, everything and it's mostly for restaurants. Everything up here, if there is, you, you, you are the distributor. That's a, yeah, it is. I mean, I, I've got 30. <laughs> When we're not laced with COVID, I've right. got 30 restaurant accounts between San Jose and Mendocino. Yeah. And I tell, I tell a lot of our friends, I'm like, all right, I'm loading up the truck. You want one or two cases? I won't and be back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It'll yeah. be another two months before I'm on my way back down right. here, but let's go. And right. it's, it's been 
wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Now, I, I really like this wine quite a bit, and it's okay. um, a much different style mm -hmm. than the it is. Truth and Valor. It is. It's got, a, it's a little more earthy, mm -hmm. and um, I think it has, one of my favorite qualities in a Pinot is um, that rose petally type of Definitely. I, I think it's it's, it's, it's... it's very elegant. It's It's got more of that red fruit focus. It's think? got more of that, that slight hint of raspberry and kirsch. It does have that rose petal, but it's not... Truth and Valor, and again, Truth and Valor was a year longer in bottle, so that was a 17 vintage. But with that Sonoma Coast, you've got more depth and, and more say more darker berry fruit, more blackberry, more blueberry. This is more red, red central. So you, you know, you're leaving, you talked about leaving the Pinot in the barrel for 17, 18 months, which is not, not everybody does that, right? I mean, no. usually it's more, I wouldn't, I, I don't want to say like, usually because everyone's got, but it's not uncommon for it to be in and out in 11 months, know, 11, yes, months. 11 months and done. Especially when you have a, uh, a marketing, team or a an owner that is looking at cash flow exactly i mean right? it's just it's you want common those, sense you to want to do be, that right but I, I feel like with with your wines that they have um that 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 extra time in barrels just um lends a little more intensity it does a little more mm -hmm. concentration and i love that right i mean i love lighter pinots as well but i mean these are just just a lot of there's, a lot got, going on there's there. good tension and it, yeah. yeah i'm also a big fan of of I like fresh fruit and I like texture. I mean, so to me, this style of what we do, they're fresh fruit. We were obsessive over sanitation. I mean, we, we just, uh, Brett and VA is nothing I ever want to have in any of my wines ever at any point in time. So that's, it's the rigorous process, not only the well, sanitation and, and with Brett, barrels. Just for, again, for people, yeah, Brett is the sort of <laughs> Band-Aid yes. case you can get. Some people think it's a complexity. It's yeah, not, it's it's not, not my terroir, favorite. Not my not gig my either. <laughs> And um, VA, VA can be overtake a Pinot. That's yes, it absolutely can. Yeah, volatile city, but. But it's really, you know, this is, from, from having the wine in barrel for that long and still maintaining the freshness, we don't do, right. the wines aren't racked until we make our blends. So it's really making sure that everything is sanitized, barrels are topped, checking the microbial activity once a month to make sure that everything is where it is supposed to be, not scattered. So you don't scattered. rack them at all after no. they go into barrels? No. So most most winemakers or wineries uh, will rack several times, and it's a again it, that's safe winemaking. It in is in that um, you're you're choosing a route that can potentially go south because you want the flavor Absolutely. and the complexity and the more interesting things. That's that also why we check the biology every with month, that winemaking decision. So right. so usually when people are racking, they're 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 hitting it with X amount of percentage of sulfur every time the rackings. You've got that exposure to air. Pino actually has, if you look on a molecular level, it's got a gap in its DNA chain. And more sulfur binds into that gap. Right. I can, I can almost 95% of the time taste somebody's Pino and taste it and understand if they bottled it within 10 or 11 months because there is that racking process that has happened to not only maintain sanitation, but also the accelerated aging process mm -hmm. as well to get that open, more expressive feel but I can taste that sulfur. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sensitive on the sulfur side. Yeah, I Susan, do you need to tell our, your audience about the racking? We didn't define racking. I know. Racking, yes, right. Racking is where oh, you literally just... let the sediment, or the solids, go to the bottom of the barrel, and mm -hmm. you, I mean, you can do it with a hose, a pump, whatever, but you just take, take it, remove it from the top, and, right. and most people get rid of the solids, most wineries. Mm -hmm. And it does clean up the wine. Thank you, George. It does. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> He's a wine I like it, George. What is racking? What is racking? <laughs> no, but you also, and, uh, do you, is everything on fine, unfiltered? That you, I was going to bring that everything up. Everything except for the, the Russian River and Sonoma Coast Pinots, because they are, they're the workhorses that, we, like I mentioned, the 25% that goes out to okay. restaurants. Makes sense. I, we do a slight, we, we do cross flow filtration on those wines just to get the m minimum amount of bacterial activity to a safe level. Yeah. And, so you and don't that, have... that's a more advanced form of filtering that isn't as... Aggressive. Harsh on the yeah. wine is... And especially for Pinot. I mean, we work so hard to have all those nuances and these, these beautiful characteristics that are in the wine. I didn't want to hard plate or strip out a lot of those, those great those great components. So well, that, that works really well for you us. You could tell on the Chardonnay. <laughs> I mean, the fact that it was unfiltered 
I love oh, yeah. creamy. I love it. Yeah, uh, I, yeah I, I do you. too. I mean, me too. It's just scary for some people, right? I mean, oh, I know. It's like, oh my gosh, me. why is this cloudy? <laughs> what? What's I that filter. milky swirl? Well, yeah. that's the 2%. I, you know what? I, I'm too neurotic to not filter. <laughs> I, I get it. Sleep I get night. it. So good for you. Well, and again, you're, it's you're, really... You're a braver man than if, I am. And, and, <laughs> and honestly, it has zero to do with bravery. If we did not have... Your key, yes, you've got... We the have a it. very detailed, rigorous process to know what okay. bacteria is there what it is eating, what it's not eating, and what it can possibly do. Well, yeah, Bob Cabral also does that. I mean, there are a lot right. of winemakers who are, you know, and it, it takes a lot of time. It, it's, <laughs> when you were it's, sitting there racking a barrel of Chardonnay yeah. and you're looking through the little, if you guys can imagine, we use a, you know, a little gas-charged pump that you, you get into the barrel. And then you have like a sight You've got glass. a kickstand <laughs> and you've got a sight window and you're sitting there with a light and you are watching liquid move. Like literally through a... For 20 minutes. And you're trying not to get the kickstand down the sludge because then you see a little yeah. whiff of, ah, damn it. Ah, ah, through through it. a glass... Uh, viewing pane. It's yeah, a tube. Yeah, viewing pane that's like four inches by yes. one inch. Yeah, and it's... <laughs> it's terribly exciting. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> I know that, uh, you know, you talked a lot about just the rigor around um, the, the lab work that you do. Yeah. Right? So I think a lot of people don't on the consumer side, I don't understand like how much uh, lab work <laughs> you wind up doing. Well, and you know? I, I think it's interesting that you have a, you actually have a microbiologist working for you, we correct? Have, we have got, I, I cannot talk a lot about Oh, no, her. no, but you have, I did. She is phenomenal. <laughs> no, that's that's wonderful though. Yeah. Very few wineries Wait, have that. She, she is a superhero. I mean, really, it's, <laughs> she's like Clark Kent. I mean, like, <laughs> out and she's, she she's incredible. The, bacteria no she is. But most wineries do not have that luxury yeah and even if you send it well you can send it to labs but it's just not the same it's it's not the same and and to be able to she has superpowers i mean she really does as far as being able to know what who when where and why that is not my strength i yeah. can taste things and know i can do a lot of the grunt work i can work with our growers i can taste grapes i can sort I can do punch downs. I, I am, I'm a pretty damn decent winemaker. What she does is on a different level. Like a bacterial avenger. It's, it's really, she, she's an <laughs> avenger superhero. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, it's phenomenal what she does. I mean, our, our wines would be really good, but with what she does, they're, they're, I think they're superior. That is well, that, that marriage of, of art, you know, artis, artis, sorry, yeah, art, craftsmanship and, and artisan. Yeah. It really, it truly is. Well, yeah. and, and, and you're throwing in a little science. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And do we have one more? We do. We have one more people. We have the to. Russian River to try. Can the mm -hmm. couch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to the couch. To the couch. Thank you, Sam. Absolutely. <laughs> mm. Okay. Okay, I'll give it up. <laughs> I like it. Okay. So I don't want to. Now, we are, I think we have some uh, footage of your vineyards and your winery. Yes. It'll be fun for people to see. And these are, and again, we don't own vineyards, we don't own a winery. But and a lot of the vineyards we work, we have seven vineyards in the Russian River that we work with, seven in the Sonoma Coast. And I mean, that, there you can see some of the, the smoky overtones of the 2020 vintage. Crazy. Uh, it was, and uh, that's Emma, our daughter. You know, the fun thing is, I mean, I shouldn't say fun. There was nothing fun about it. But sampling You're not talking about the oh, okay, go on. sampling <laughs> for smoke taint. Oh. So a lot of the clusters yeah, you had to fun. remove thirty berries without rupturing them. Exactly. From every god darn cluster. So I mean that was Emma. She was very unhappy. I mean all I did was have her hold a bag as we were going through doing sampling for Well and that's because precursors. for, for the was, uh, smoke taint testing, yes. they had very uh, strict uh, protocol. But part of it, part of the problem was that it's new. You know, we're, we're still learning how to even test one for One lab it. that knew how to test for one compound, and there are thousands of compounds around smoking. Yeah, tank. yeah. So, I mean, even, even, I mean, for better or worse, I've had some good experience with smoke taint over the years. And it is, for a lot of folks that made, I mean, we, we experimented. We only made a little bit of Chardonnay from the 2020 vintage up here. 
in my opinion, last year, one of the few places that I had been able to see that did not get smoke was Santa Rita Hills. So we brought in nine tons from two incredible vineyards in Santa Rita Hills near Sea Smoke area. Uh, but it was last vintage was the first time we, we have not done a Russian River or Sonoma Coast Pinot. No had, red wine from Sonoma Had County. you been working with the fruit down there? Was that no. just wow? This was, I mean, when we, so when those, those lightning strikes happened, yeah, uh, it was, it was one of those. I was paying attention to it in the middle of the night and got up and the, the kids were kind of weirded out. They're like, why aren't you out? And I said, well, I, I think I'm going to be out for a while. I want to have a nice breakfast with you guys. And because even though, even though it's only 14 vineyards in Sonoma County that we work with, you can't see them all in one day. Right. From mountaintops, that's single all, lane roads. That's, you, you not a lo there's, that's not only 14 is yeah, it, ridiculous. It's, it's, that's a lot of vineyards. It's a lot. So to be able to, I knew that I had to get out and see where wind patterns were, where smoke was. And so within that first day, knowing, I mean, one of the great things about Sonoma County is we start out usually and it's cool. And then we, we get warmer during the day and then we get cool again at night. And that has the wind pattern changes all the way around. Of course, yeah. So there were some of the vineyards in Russian River that I was seeing in the morning. There was no smoke inversion yet. By the time I got into the afternoon, and this was on that first day, smoke was already inverted down into the vineyards. So I started doing smoke berry sampling that evening. Well, and what was happening during the fires is that um, the, the smoke you're talking about the smoke patterns mm -hmm. because there were there could be a fire right by a vineyard but the smoke was such that it, it three miles away it yeah, would, it was it would a crazy, up and down it was a crazy or, situation so and, and when you had all those different fires going the smoke was doing this and it right. was doing that and then yeah, it would change every six hours or so and well, it was and it was windy and so it was it, it was bad it was, a, it was but challenging to make matters worse once it sorry Sam no, no, drug, go but, ahead. but as as other people started doing what Sam was doing. You're sending these, the, these, the fruit into the lab, and the lab wasn't get, They were so oh, backed up. It would, you'd they be wait, turn it so over. you were, weren't getting results back in time yeah. to make any kind of decisions, and it just had to be incredibly those, frustrating. Those first, so I think I submitted samples on that second day, and I got those results back in four days. And then I'm thinking, all right, this is great. So cool, we're going, right? that works. Getting more samples, and I went to drop them off at ETS, and I go, okay, 27 days. I'm like, guys, I can't. I need to make a decision on this. Yeah. I can't. So, yeah, I mean, I know there's nothing they can do. That was again the collaborating with other Pinot colleagues from over the years. Going, okay, I've hit this zone. What have you guys hit? Yeah. So then we started looking at, and then we were doing. You know, I had four micro fermentations going in our bathtub just to try and assess the finished juice. Yep. But by the time we got 72 hours into it, I knew that nothing was going to be serviced. At least for me, the vineyards. The regions that we're at, I knew that it was going to be really, really difficult. So I made a call that night, third night in, to a good friend in Santa Rita Hill. I was looking well, Purple and, Air. And, uh, mm -hmm. oh, go on. There's a website called Purple Air, and I've encouraged a lot of my growers to start buying these sensors where we can at least see if there has been exposure at a certain point in time to particulates. So I was using this website looking at weather patterns all the way from Washington State all the way down to Southern California. The only place that I was seeing that wasn't getting smoke over that period of time was Santa Rita Hills. So that's why you secured fruit. I, from I there. called. I called an old Greg Brewer, who's an, a good longtime oh, friend. I, I, I called Greg. I said, "Greg," and he goes, "Lando." And I said, "Greg, uh, <laughs> am I correct in seeing that you guys haven't seen any smoke?" And he just goes, "Shh, come down." He goes, "Make it down tonight." He's a great guy. Uh, he's a great guy. So he dialed me in with these two vineyards, and I went to to check them out and viticulture was on point. Everything was great. There was, so it's, it's exciting. We're, this series of wines where we're gonna, we're gonna and, continue and that's, on. And that's 2020, correct? 2020, so we're gonna call them our resilience series of Pinot Noirs. I'm, I'm gonna just briefly say that's the, cool. mi the yeah. micro fermentation concept is that uh, since you couldn't get an analytical result back, mm -hmm. you would do a sensory fermentation right. and simply ta ferment it and taste it because the fire I mean, the smoke taint came from the grapes themselves, right. and so that's why whites were not a problem. Right. But I, I say this a lot, any wine from 2020 that's in a bottle is going to taste good from Sonoma County because Absolutely. everybody's able to test for it. They do it as sensory analysis, and nobody is going to be putting anything in a bottle that doesn't, doesn't taste that, good. 
That is the true. That is the, so, the best statement so, out there. So su support Sonoma County Absolutely. in 2020. If if people put something in a bottle from 2020, it's it'll be good. It's like a 99 percent authentication authentication that it is it's going to be good to go. And there were definitely places in the county that didn't get hit. I mean that it's just unfortunate the places that we were at. I'm like, nope, this is <laughs> this is screwed. We got to figure well, it out. Yeah, I can't. I love Santa Rita. Pinot, and I haven't I'm, had one in a while. Well, the the we'll we'll correct that. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah. Love to try it, George. The, the, yes. Are we, you in? I'm definitely <laughs> in. We we had been looking. I mean, I, as much as I'm, my, my true love is Russian River and Sonoma Coast. I mean, I love everything that these little microclimates do for Pinot Noir. But we had been looking, whether it was Anderson and, and Valley or Santa Rita where Hills. Where Santa Rita Hills is exactly? Santa Rita Hills is it's it's a fascinating viticulture area. So it is just over the ridge from Santa Barbara, uh, Buellton area. It is one of the only longitudinal, mo most of our valleys and causeways run north and south in California. This is one of the few microclimates that runs east-west. Mm -hmm. So it actually almost connects directly to the Pacific Ocean. So it has very similar uh, diurnal shift patterns that we see in the Russian River. So they or we get, get the, the fog inversion. Oh, so they get the marine layer. They get the marine that layer that just through. sucks right in and it billows all the way through. Yeah. So it really, that sort of positioning kept a lot of the smoke, even from Santa Cruz and Santa Lucia Highlands, it never hit that point. So they had this one drawing point from the ocean that never had these other atmospheric uh, smoke properties align and draw in so it's almost like they're getting they're getting a path of clean air absolutely basically yeah. absolutely That's a pretty and good it's it's really you know from from whatever thousands of years ago i mean some of these vineyards that we're working with you take you take a handful of the soil and you've got calcium carbonate and you have seashells yeah because it used to be the marine bed and so it's, it's really they're beautiful vineyards so it's it's kind of a new frontier, even though that viticulture area has been around for a couple of decades. It, it's an exciting place. So I'm. This is kind of one of those scenarios where, when when one door closes, another one opens. Oh, definitely. And it's really allowed us to venture into a new spot that we're we're excited to be. Well, and Greg's probably excited that, to work with you. It's and, it's and an you'll have treat. this an ongoing. Absolutely, and there are even some other vineyards. So I mean, just spending time down there and getting to know the. The, the lay of the land and the players and who is doing what now it's it's opened up other relationships and other other opportunities for for other fruit which is amazing hopefully no, we'll be able to buy a vineyard someday no, another somewhere. chapter right another it chapter is. In, in it is and I, and I think it's also i mean between one thing that we've all learned from all the weirdness that we have seen in four years around here i can't keep all my eggs just in this basket well, that's why you need to get the RV <laughs> and cruise the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> that's been, the that's land been pretty crazy. crazy. The Lando Cruiser. I know, yes, it's true though. You, yeah. I mean, seriously. Maybe, mm -hmm. I mean, you've got a sense of adventure. It's sort of fun to venture out of Russian River Valley. I would rather do it on much more leisurely terms. <laughs> you know, not, not it's having like the first Burning Man. That's what you just did. It was the first <laughs> exactly. Burning Man. <laughs> It'll Let's get go. better. It'll get better. Less peyote, <laughs> less mushrooms. You know, it was it was a good time. Good time, but stressful. So, um, do you have any more road trips coming up? We do. So, actually, we've taken we've taken this concept now with the, the the band of merry revelers that we have, the wineries, and now that we've started to be able to travel a little bit and offer them at auctions, it's really funny because people are losing their minds on something. We've we've now sold probably $200,000 worth of these trips as auction packages. Well, how, how do people find out about, can they go to your website? There is nothing on the website. I mean, this so, is... Oh, so it's word of mouth. This you has been word of mouth, watch. and this yeah, has you been... you have to be there, man. Yeah, you've got to be here right now. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> no, it's true. So it's really, it's, it's, been, it's been now that we're starting to do public events again, and I'm able to go out and do some of these charity wine auctions. I've put it as an auction lot, like, hey, you can have us do our Sonoma social distance wine tour and a barbecue. We'll do it for 40 or 50 people, and people are spending a lot of money on charity events. How to, cool is that, though, man? It's, it's very it's cool. It's pretty, pretty yeah. cool. So they, so they need to look for the events. Look for the and events. And they, they can't buy your wine, or they well, can't they, buy your the wine. The best thing I tell people, Susie, is... <laughs> why are you here? I know, yeah, why are you here? It, that's a great question. Why the hell am I... I'm here because of you, Susie. That's right. 
And now it's it's uh, you have meant so much to the community and everything you do. It's great to be here, oh, but it, it's also good you. to share our wines. No, so it's, I'm, we, uh, if people would like to get our wines, the best thing to do is go to our website, sign up on our mailing list. Uh, we we are we're going to be seeing a little bit of a shortage next year. I mean, it's we were supposed to do 50 tons of Pinot Noir last year, and we did 9.8. We don't have a lot of reserve wine sitting in a warehouse that we have not been selling. We sell out of everything, Good but for you. we are going to. It's fabulous. My only saving grace is that I've held 25 to 30 cases of each one of the wines, in theory, to use for dinners and events over the years. So, I mean, we are going to come up with creative packages of library wines to verticals and, verticals like and yeah. share with our mailing list friends. So, it's. Eh, we'll, we'll figure it out. Well, your sense of adventure, your sense of philanthropy, um, everything. I just love how you handled the whole <laughs> COVID situation. Thank you. Um, he also gives back to our community. We do. Oh, yes. We do. We do oh, a lot yes. of. We do as much charity work around oh, here. Oh no! Absolutely. Yes, uh, it's my yes, pleasure. We, yes, we all thank you for what you do for it the is, community. It, we try to do as as much. It's amazing. I can have an entire business of giving away wine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and be successful. It would be a great, be a great business. Really we wouldn't make successful. any money, yes. <laughs> but it's, uh, we, we have so many great, incredible causes here in our community uh, between children and, and medical and health issues and cancer. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's been the pleasure of my life to be able to do that and, and have this as a medium or a conduit to do that. It's been a treat. Well, those are lovely words, and it was fabulous having you here. My pleasure. And um, Healdsburg is open, so come it is. visit us. It is. Open. Come on we, up. We want to see you. And um, George, it's always a pleasure. It's great. Cheers, I love being here. I get to. I, I don't have to do hardly <laughs> anything. Cheers. Here. Just hang Cheers. Out. It's great. Sam, um, awesome seeing you. And we will see you soon in the courtyard. And in the meantime, enjoy wine, enjoy life. Cheers. Yeah.